The United States holds great influence, power, and political advantages with its oil industry. As of 2023, the U.S. ranks first in oil consumption in the world, with over 20 to 25 percent of oil consumed inside of it. Furthermore, within the country, Texas is the lead producer, producing as much as 1.8 billion barrels per year. Within the state itself, the geographical Permian Basin is the largest oil producing basin in all of the United States, with Midland and Odessa inside of it being the top two producing cities. Following producing cities alongside other oil related industry hubs includes Houston, Austin, San Antonio, and Dallas. All that one time, the world's richest acre and densest oil development in the world was laid within the small town of Kilgore, Texas. Settled in Gray County, Texas, lays a tiny, unincorporated town by the name of Danville. Founded in 1847, the community was named by S. Slade Barnett, father to Miss Fanny Barnett, and their relatives in honor of their former hometown in Danville, Kentucky. Another prominent settler within the community went by the name of William Henry Harrison Rawson, from Columbia, Tennessee, who acquired some 400 acres and became the Justice of the Peace for the precinct of Russ County, and would later become a prominent congressman and commissioner. The Gum Spring Presbyterian Church, now known as the First Presbyterian Church of Kilgore, was created in 1848 and would later be chartered in 1852, playing a big part for education, community gatherings, events, and more. A post office would later open in 1850 by the name of Rabbit Creek, which was renamed to New Danville in 1852 and would stay in operation until 1873. The community peaked around the time of the Civil War, being home to four stores, multiple saloons, a hand-fed gin that was powered by two mules, and a blacksmith shop. However, as the community continued to prosper, the decline would sharpen quickly by the 1870s, and even further when the International Great Northern Railroad bypassed the community just a little over four miles west. This was due to a bargaining between Rayburn Hamilton, son-in-law to Slade Barnett, who denied the railroad magnate Jay Gold access to their land. Married to Miss Fanny Barnett and son-in-law to Slade Barnett, alongside Justice of the Peace and landowner, Constantine Buckley Kilgore, often referred to as Buck Kilgore, took advantage of the matter to establish township on his land, and when Gold turned to Kilgore after denial, they came to an agreement in which a 200 feet right-of-way that contained a 15-acre strip of land within the way would be donated to the International Great Northern Railroad and was signed on October 28, 1871. Thereafter, in June of 1872, Mr. and Mrs. Kilgore sold a 174-acre town site to gold for 2,800 golden dollars. The Kilgores received 1,400 golden dollars for the land and received the remaining 1,400 gold dollars six months later. Both Buckley Kilgore and his wife moved from Kilgore to Willis Point in 1877, in which Buckley would become an important and distinguished entity among state politics and would be elected as a state senator and just two years later would be elected as a member of the Federal House of Representatives. When Buckley Kilgore's tenure in Congress ended in 1894, he petitioned President Grover Cleveland for a public appointment, and in response, Buckley was appointed as a U.S. District Judge in Oklahoma and took oath into office on April 3, 1895. A few years passed until his passing in an Indian Territory, or what is now known as Ardmore, Oklahoma, on September 3, 1897. He is now buried with his children in White Rose Cemetery, Willis Point. Constantine Buckley Kilgore made a permanent mark in history, and soon after, the town would thrive in a boom. Even after the Kilgore family moved locations, the town grew and prospered. Without a doubt, Buckley Kilgore was an exceptional man with great power and influence. However, after his death, history and time would march on. When the railroad was laid, a mule barn was converted into the depot becoming the Kilgore INGN Missouri Pacific Railroad Station. It was later remodeled a few times and still sits today, closed, however, preserved. Many residents from New Danville fled to Kilgore shortly afterwards, as the track began to shine a new era of industry, transportation, and recognition amongst the young community. Post Office was built in 1873, establishing the community as a new, thriving town, with the name of Kilgore in honor of Constantine Buckley Kilgore, Around the same time as this, the original community four miles east of Kilgore would keep the name Danville, removing the new sometime later in the period. By 1885, the town of Kilgore mainly consisted of plantations and farms, with cotton plantations and mills being the lead factor of the town's early industry, alongside timber and cattle which was shipped through the Kilgore train depot.
By this time, the population was around 250 people. Kilgore had two steam gristmill cotton gins, a few stores, and a school, which went by the name of the Alexander Institute and was the successor of the former New Danville Masonic Female Academy. The institute was a large two-story structure before the existence of regularized public schools and had an auditorium alongside several classrooms. The school offered courses from primary to college level and was regarded most often as a finishing school for girls and a preparatory school for boys. In 1894, the school relocated to Jacksonville, becoming the Lawn Morris College, and continues to stand today. However, the college filed for bankruptcy on July 2, 2012, and was auctioned on January 14, 2013. Following the relocation, the Kilgore Independent School District was formed on August 27, 1906, and a public school occupied the site until April of 1913, when it was dismantled and the lumber was used to construct a new private residence. The Kilgore High School was constructed shortly afterwards onto the now-present Longview Street. The school was a beautiful, two-story red brick building, and continued to grow throughout the years as a public school for students around the town. The consistency of the town's population and businesses remained the same, and by 1914, the town had two banks, the most prominent one being the Kilgore State Bank, previously opened on August 27, 1906. Additionally, the town also contained several Baptist and Methodist churches, innumerable general stores, a hotel, and an ice cream parlor, concluding with a population of 700 people. By 1929, the population of Kilgore had reached 1,000, but began to decline tremendously over the coming years due to the combined effects of the Great Depression alongside the decline of cotton, which for several decades was the main source of revenue for the town. By the start of 1930, the population had declined to as little as 500 people, which, in effect, forced many other businesses to close. Oil had been discovered for many decades and even centuries prior to the Spindle Top Field alongside other states as the Chinese were documented to have been using bamboo constructed pipelines to transport oil as far back as 600 BC. After it was transported, they would use it to fuel fires and to boil seawater. Moreover, rock oil was struck in Titusville, Pennsylvania by Edwin L. Drake in 1859, which jump-started the oil rush in America. Oil quickly became one of the most valuable commodities in the United States. However, the rush would die out by the mid-1870s until western states such as Texas, Oklahoma, Wyoming, and California, just to name a few, kicked off the new oil boom once again. One major forthcoming was Spindletop in 1901, which would also mark the start of the modern-day petroleum industry. Thousands flocked to find oil, and as years would pass, soon the discovery of oil would be introduced further north of the greater East Texas region as a result of the Joyner Daisy Bradford Well. Columbus Marion Joyner was born on March 12, 1860, in Lauderdale County, Alabama. In his early life, he moved to Tennessee to practice law, and was elected legislature in 1889. Joyner stayed for some time until he moved again, this time into Ardmore, Oklahoma, in 1897, for inexpensive land. He lost his land in 1907, which would influence him to drill over 100 wells all over Oklahoma in an attempt to regain his losses in 1913. Afterwards, he would move to Texas in 1926 as he was convinced there was oil in Rust County. Several geologists said otherwise, stating he would only be drilling barren land with nothing but rock and sand. However, he continued into the summer of 1927 in an attempt to sell certificates of interest. Joyner later grouped up with his driller, Tom M. Jones, and would begin the initial drilling for an oil well alongside an 80-acre tract belonging to Daisy Bradford. He drilled for six months with no findings of oil, and the hole became lost to a stuck pipe at 1,099 feet. Joyner abandoned the well and continued his search, and on April 14, 1928, he organized a syndicate from a lease of 500 acres. The finances went into what was known as the Bradford Daisy No. 2, reaching 2,518 feet until the drill pipe twisted off and blocked the hole. Driller Ed Laster moved their drilling into a new location. It was within a close proximity to the second site, just 375 feet away, and spotted the Joyner Daisy Bradford No. 3. On September 5, 1930, 3,592 feet into the woodbine sand, the rig would bring forth the signs of oil. Finally, after months of securing proper financing and casing, the well blew and gushed with oil. Meanwhile, over reported 1,000 spectators gazed at the black gold spewing into the sky. The boom was on.
Jordan would live to witness his discovery swallow East Texas, eventually passing away on March 27, 1947, in Dallas, Texas as a broke man. The Joyner Daisy Bradford number 3 still pumps to this day, and Marion Joyner is often remarked as the daddy of the East Texas oil field. With the success of the Discovery Well, J. Malcolm Krim, resident of Kilgore, believed there was more oil surrounding the area. Several geologists claimed it was not possible, and he would be drilling barren land such as the claims made towards Joyner. However, Malcolm Krim would start drilling atop of the land which belonged to his mother, Lou Della Krim, on October 17, 1930, though it was named Lou Della Krim No. 1 after his mother. Then, on December 28, 1930, Success came and oil gushed from the well, bringing in over 20,000 barrels a day before being shut down in 1931. The small declining town immediately fell into the effects of the oil boom, becoming a boomtown in of itself. In only a few short days, over 3,000 people would flock and scatter into the town, setting up tents and shacks in every space available, small or large as long as it was empty and vacant. Many people coming in that worked on the oil rigs were nicknamed Roughnecks, due to the rugged nature of the individuals alongside the complexion of the rough, crude, and callous skin from operating and handling the machinery and pipes within the rigs. Honky Tonk bars would be set up all over the town, with the mass onslaught of people moving in. Schools and several other public institutions were overwhelmed and crammed. Shotgun homes were built to fit the extra students due to the cramming of the then-present schools. As a final response to the mass growth, the city was incorporated on February of 1931. By 1936, the population swarmed to a staggering 12,000 residents. Geologists thought the well was a separate field, but they were wrong. It was discovered that the various wells were one singular field that stretched across almost the entire Upper East Texas region. The field extended across regions of Gregg, Rusk, Smith, Upshur, and Cherokee counties, combining a total of 30,340 historic wells. It's measured to be around 45 miles north to south and 5 to 12 miles wide, making it, to this day, the most prolific and largest oil field in the continental United States. This was part of a geological phenomenon beneath the Woodbine Sand Formation that pinched out along the Sabine Uplift, most often called the Woodbine Sand Play, or East Texas Basin. Kilgore became a major location for drilling during the boom, as the town is located near the geographic center of the field, thus transforming it into an important transportation, processing, production, supply, and service hub for both the oil industry and the thousands of people moving across the East Texas region as a whole. Despite the hundreds of boom towns rising and spawning across the region, Kilgore remained the largest oil city, spouting up to 1,100 skyscraping derricks at its height within the city limits. One block with the greatest concentration of wells stood to be known as the world's richest anchor, and still stands today with several historic markers, picnic tables, and a tiny replica of the entire acre. Due to the mass production of oil, production started to become out of control alongside activity within the town. When the Bradford No. 3 began production, the price of crude oil was 99 cents per barrel. However, it declined to as much as 46 cents per barrel. Oilmen increased production to combat the change. Despite best efforts, it lowered prices even more. As 1930 continued all across Gray County, the oil business maintained a stable boom. Restrictions were put in place to only produce 50,000 barrels per day, compared to the current yield of 200,000 barrels per day. Although most operators disregarded the laws and rules and continued making as much as they pleased, around the midsummer of 1931, as much as 900,000 barrels of crude oil were produced per day across nearly 1,200 wells in the county. On July 14, 1931, prices fell as low as 13 cents per barrel. On August 17, 1931, Governor Ross S. Sterling ordered marshals and the Texas National Guard into the field to shut down all of its 1,644 wells to maintain order. However, the field resumed production on September 5, 1931, under a new order that would limit the production to only 400,000 barrels of crude oil per day. As 1931 came to an end, the East Texas oil field reported its yearly legal production of 121,670,000 barrels of oil and 627 million cubic feet of gas. The year after, 1932, as the federal court made the previous poration orders illegal, 
and the production of hot oil illegal, the yearly number was 148,325,961 barrels of oil and 5,268,000,000 cubic feet of gas. The trend of inspectors, operations, laws, and other production standards and non-compliances would continue into the next year, marking its largest production year, with over 11,000 wells bringing in over 216,291,397 barrels of oil and 7,805,000,000 cubic feet of gas. Eventually, through the Canali Hot Oil Act, Texas Hot Oil Institute, and the National Industrial Recovery Act, Oil production was limited and enacted upon by reducing how much oil would flow through the pipelines, be transported, and sold throughout 1934 and 1935. Eventually, most of the problems of the field faced for the first decade found solutions, and as World War II neared and the United States became more involved, the oil field became part of the largest pipeline ever laid in that age, becoming part of both the Big Inch and the Little Inch. The Big Inch was an oil pipeline running from East Texas town, Longview, into northeastern states such as Illinois, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, and ended in New Jersey, alongside the smaller pipeline, the Little Inch, running from Vermont and continuing the same path as the Big Inch from East Texas. The Big Inch transported crude oil. Meanwhile, the Little Inch transported more refined products. Both pipelines helped win the war as it supplied oil to the United States and would also be delivered through tankers for allies throughout the 1940s and part of the Big Inch remains in operation today. It was also discovered that later within the next decade or two, some people illegally stole oil by drilling slanted holes through the Woodbine Basin, taking oil from larger companies and properties. However, nobody was ever convicted, and the only consequences faced were fines and public embarrassment. Incidents like this were uncommon to happen around the time, and still take place from time to time in several other oil fields. After World War II, the boom maintained a steady activity. However, the field still played a key role in economics and the industry entirely. As stated previously before, the big and little inch pipelines were one of the most crucial roles the East Texas oil field was connected with. However, by the 1950s, oil was not produced nearly as much. The crim wells were abandoned due to rising salt water. However, oil still continues to be jeweled as of today. Even if it is not as much as the quantities beforehand, the 1930s and 1940s were without a doubt the historical point of Gilgore and the climax of the town. It gave rise to thousands of derricks, contributed to the East Texas oil field, which, in return, contributed to World War II efforts and would push the country's economy further than it had ever been. During the time of the boom, one of the most prominent locations built was the Texan Theater in 1931. The theater served as a go-to place for westerns. It also served as the most modern theater in the area around the time, and housed a different audience compared to the later Krim Theater. The Kilgore City Hall also opened during the time, helping administrate community services, administration, and other city departments. In March of 1932, Gregg County voters approved a $1.5 million bond that would give 122 miles of roads and 60 miles of state highways, thus turning the muddy paths, rugged hills, and crowded forests of the east into easily traversable roadways and connecting the county with other cities and communities far and near. The red brick KISD building was raised in 1932 as a 1913 school was deemed inadequate to house the students within the booming city, and a new expansion of the oldest part of the school was erected in 1933, combining the junior high, auditorium, and high school. Soon after, the college would be erected in 1935 after approval by the Texas Board of Education housing 11 faculty members and 229 students, and would later become home to the Rangerettes on September 19, 1940. The Rangerettes were in the first of its kind, bringing a spectacular show business to the field during the football season with the lead of Miss Gussie Nell Davis. The college soon opened classes on September 13, 1935, and in 1979, Casey opened a satellite campus on Longview. In 1935, Charles K. Duvall established the Kilgore Herald, and five years later, he bought a rival paper by the name of the Daily News and renamed it to the Kilgore News Herald. Charles continued to publish papers until 1979 when he retired. He later passed away on January 29, 1995, and is buried within the Kilgore Cemetery. The Crim Theater was built in 1938 and opened a year after on June 21, 1939.
The theater was the successor of the previous Texan theater and was one of the most prominent within the East, as the Crim was a flagship of the East Texas theaters chain, operating over 80 movie houses between Marshall and Beaumont. The Crim was also operated by Paramount Pictures Incorporated through subsidiary Julius Gordon in 1941. As the 1940s marched on, the population declined as oilmen and others slowly moved out. The population began to stabilize around 5,000 to 6,000 residents. The town's population continued to fluctuate, with minor increases in numbers of people throughout the 50s and 60s. 1950 had a recorded population of 9,058, 1960 with a population of 10,092, and 1970 with 10,500 people. The 1960s and 1970s were not as active compared to the previous decades. However, Businesses would still come and go, and much of its economy depended on the oil and gas industry, meanwhile benefiting from other minor industries such as manufacturing, shipping, agriculture, and distribution chains. The Kilgore Drive-In Theater was opened on August 12, 1950, and became another prominent theater in the town. It was one of the best in the region, gaining major attraction and attention, and lasted for several decades with hundreds of screenings within its lifetime. By 1965, Kilgore had reached 578 rated businesses. The Cram Theater also closed in 1966, and preservation efforts would later come into effect. By the 1970s, the Kilgore National Bank building closed, and a historical marker remains today to reflect back on the early era of the town's businesses. Furthermore, in 1975, the Kilgore Drive-In Theater closed, and it would later become abandoned for some time before being torn down and the property used to construct the new Kilgore Middle and Primary Schools. One more major event within this time period began the removal of several oil derricks within Kilgore from the mid-1960s and into the late 1970s. Due to new mobile workover rigs being made and modern pump jacks advancing, the use of standing rigs became obsolete. Thus, the clearing began until only a very few amount of derricks were left. As the 1980s arrived, it marked the beginning of the oil bust resulting in oil no longer dominating Great County and Kilgore's primary economy. However, it was not the death of it, as several pumps are still in operation today, and the field still produces to some extent. Due to the removal of historic derricks, the Kilgore Historical Preservation Foundation was chartered and organized in 1987 to restore the famous steel skyline, the KHPF was chartered by the state of Texas by Mickey Smith, Rob Slayer, and Ronnie Spradlin. Ronnie Spradlin was elected as the group president before others resigned. Other citizens were soon appointed to the foundation, involving Amanda Nobles, Sue Brown, Sandy Sue Holland, Tom Brown, Jimmy Dyke, Joe White, Virginia Long, Bobby Florence, and others. Another important contribution was Charles L. Miller and his crew by helping re-erect the derricks alongside putting up the stars and holiday lights. And today, a plaque sits on the richest acre, memorizing Charles. He passed on March 10, 2018, aged 71 years old. Moreover, during the early 1990s, the Kilgore Historic Preservation Foundation began a discussion over what to name the project between the City of Derricks or City of Stars. And after a Southern Living article was written by a native son, Gary Ford, the foundation board went with the City of Stars. The saying, alongside Welcome to Kilgore, was placed on the Crim Theater's marquee when the facade renovation was completed in 1999. Finally, in 2005, the goal to restore 50 derricks was completed, alongside a few more being re-erected and updated around the late part of the 2000s. Much changed from the 1990s and the 2000s. The population by 2000 was 11,301 and many businesses were functioning and being created, maintaining a somewhat stabilized flow. Synergy Park opened in 2006, paving and creating several walking trails, roads, and a business park. The park also includes several picnic tables, rest areas, a bathroom, and a fishing pier, with Elder Lake being situated in the middle of the park. The 2017 plans were announced to revitalize the Texan Theater as a public venue to host events, and in 2018, the theater was finally restored. The theater is also home of the Real East Texas Film Festival. As the 2010s and now the 2020s progressed, population has been ever-increasing, businesses thriving, and industry growing. 2010 estimated a population of 12,975, and 2022 with a population of 13,476. As of 2023, the city has reached over 150 years, as it was celebrated in 2022. There is still much to do within the town, or as much as a small town has to offer. 
Much of the economy involves industry-level blue-collar companies, which includes manufacturing, shipping, and distribution companies, and of course, oil and gas, although some aspects of agriculture still remain. The attractions, landmarks, history, industry, and demographics are all of what makes Goa truly extraordinary. The city is small, but the connections along with the community is vast. Buckley Kilgore made a lasting impact for the future throughout the town and state as an entirety, and the community has a sense of pride like no other, and is called home for thousands. However, with the town outlasting Buckley for over a century, it has also had a lasting impact not just for the state, but the nation as a whole. I know there are several other nibbits and details of events, and rest assured I do have plans to come back and discuss those topics. I wanted to keep this as generalized as possible, meanwhile giving enough detail to make out the category of events that took place. Thank you for watching and listening. Have an amazing day.